Hi everyone, my name is Michael Stewart. I am the Director of Education here at the OI Foundation, and I want to welcome everyone to today's session. Uh, this is a uh, Brittle Bone Disorders uh, Consortium update on uh, a research update on dental health with Dr. Jean-Marc uh, Retrové. Uh, we are very excited for today's session. Just a few quick updates for everyone before we get started. So like other OIF sessions, uh, we want to remind everyone that today's session is not telemedicine, which means that we cannot uh, ask the medical professionals on uh, today's call direct medical questions about uh, like care. Basically, they cannot give you direct care online on the internet without proper licenses, and we're going to avoid that completely. Also, we want to remind everyone that we keep everyone's microphone muted throughout the entire meeting so that we can best hear, uh, hear the information being shared. Today's session is mostly going to be focusing on the research, research that is being done within the BBDC. You're going to hear that acronym a lot throughout today, uh, the Brittle Bone Disease uh, Consortium. Uh, some of the things that we're going to be talking about are around dental health and orthodontics. Oh, not some, all the things we're gonna talk about, sorry. Uh, and with that being said, if you have any questions for the speakers, uh, we're gonna be designated some time at the very end of today. If you wanna type your questions into the chat, we will try to answer as many as we can. Uh, today's session is gonna last for one, approximately one hour long. Um, so with that being said, I'm gonna introduce the Chief Executive Officer of the OI Foundation, Tracy Hart. Uh, Tracy, thank you. Sure. Thanks, Michael. And welcome, everyone. It's good to see some familiar faces. And so glad you're joining us this evening or this afternoon, wherever you are in the world. So, so glad you're here. So I have the, um, the great privilege of asking our, our speaker tonight some questions. Um, he's probably familiar to many of you, but I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Jean-Marc Retrové, who is the endowed chair and prof Leo Rogers endowed Chair and Professor of Orthodontics at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. I know he has a couple of other titles as well, but um, that's what we're going with, with tonight. So um, Dr. Retrovey, we're gonna just jump right in because I know people um, that don't know you would probably like to know a little bit about yourself, why you're committed to OI research, dental craniofacial research, and how you got involved with the Brittle Bone Disorders Consortium. Okay, yes, thanks to you, nice to be here. <laughs> And I'm always happy to participate in any OIF event with Tracy. It's always a great pleasure. So it's a, it's a long story and a short one, actually. Uh, in 2006, which is already 15 years ago, uh, Dr. Gloria and Dr. Schwartz at the Montreal Children, I was at the Children in Montreal at the time, uh, we saw a few patients like Dr. Gloria, who is one of our, I would say, pioneers in OI and probably person that knows probably the most of one of them anyways, uh, was sending us patients and we didn't quite know what to, to do with the um, presentation of the, of the problem. Um, and eventually what we decided uh, to do a small grant with the Shriners uh, to start studying the, uh, the condition. And then with Dr. Rausch and others, but for me it was mainly Dr. Frank Rausch helped me. We ended up uh, writing a grant uh, uh, through the NIH and we, uh, they created the BBDC, the Brittle Bone Disease Consortium, and I was kind of in charge of the craniofacial and dental aspect of the uh, problem. So, and I made a joke one day because I still have seen one of my dear patients in 2011, 10, whatever. Uh, she was a little lady from Quebec. And when I spoke to Dr. Gloria, I said, I don't know what to do with her. And she said, he said to me, so what are you going to do? So I think I'm going to put braces on her. So he said, that's it, you're the world expert because no one has ever done it. So I had I paid one patient of one, an OI type three, and I saw her a year and a half ago during COVID and she was doing fine, uh, just before COVID. And she was still doing fine, which was very, very good. And since then we treated a few patients. I've been helping out a lot of patients, a lot of dentists and orthodontists with advice. And as Michael says, I don't do teledentistry. I just provide advice and do the best I can. So I don't know if it answers your question. And I love doing the rare disease, uh, consortium because I have the privilege to work with very smart people and it makes me look smarter than I really am. So that's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was perfect. So um, craniofacial research has been a part of the Brittle Bone Disorders Consortium from the very beginning. 
So can you talk about the, the first study titled Dental Malclusion and Craniofacial Development in OI and why that was important? What, what has that led to? Because that yes. was a very important study. The problem that we had with OI, uh, again, in 2010-11, because that's, that's when we started, is no one had a clue. So what we wrote, and that's Dr. Atkinson from the NIH and NICDR, and Dr. Laura Tosi, so uh, who's a, a orthopedic surgeon from Washington. Uh, what, what they did really, is called a longitudinal study. So we gathered as many people as possible with OI, regardless of their types. And we looked at their dentition and their craniofacial, uh, the way they presented to try to see how many were in one category, how many were in the other, what the severity of the, we call this a phenotype, which is the expression of the genes. Uh, we looked at that and then we kept on evolving. So now we have a, almost a thousand patients in the BBDC, which is the largest sample of dental uh, records in the world for OI. And my wife who's a dental photographer has personally done about 300 sets of these pictures. So it, it got us to a, a much higher level of understanding of the problem. And since then we have two more studies coming up. So I think, I think it was very valuable to do this very tedious work, just gathering all the information. So now we have a good database that we can rely on and do research with. Wonderful. You talked about publications. I know that might sound a little boring to people, but why is that important for us as a community to have publications out there on, on the research? <laughs> it was a good one. So that's just not related to why it's, it's disseminating uh, knowledge. So you can do publications and I could show you, I just got one last year from one of my bright students that we actually made the cover page of the Journal of American Dental Association and that get us a lot of a lot of publicity, if you want. And I was just on quality of life. I've done publications in Bonn with one of our actually one of our uh, postdocs or a, a PhD student, and the student team, or she has a PhD now on on uh, on dentinogenesis imperfecta, the dentition of the um, the OI, uh, I would say, subjects. And what happened is a lot of people are reading these these papers. And they learn from that. And I've been able to teach and, and talk to about five or six or seven different countries and also getting people from all over the world contacting us to say, what can we do with OI patients? Because I always say there are more dentists in the US than OI subjects. So they ha we have to be able to disseminate knowledge as, as, as broadly as possible. Excellent. So. I know, you know, we started this in 2011 or 10 or whatever. How has technology changed even in the last 10 years? And is that affecting what we're able to do right now? In how, long, how long do you have? <laughs> well, technology, I'm kind of a, I'm known the techno geek, you know. Um, I've, I've gone from, I, I was the first, one of the first person in the world to do a, 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 a scan, an internal scan of a patient since 1993. So the, what we do now, and we have patients in Kansas City who have rare disease and some who have OI. Now with the, the, the biggest change, we went from basically a 2D uh, format of you know, filling forms, taking radiographs in two dimension and taking sometimes study models, you know, the famous models with a gunk in the mouth to all the way now to cone beam CTs and medical CTs in 3D. And now what we do, we also add a neutral scan and we have the largest sample uh, in Montreal and now Kansas City, yeah, the VBDC, sorry, uh, the large sample of 3D uh, scans of OI patients, which allows us to do a lot of research. And that's why we're able to push another project. So the technology is evolving so quickly that we have a hard time following. What we do now, basically, we can finish the cases or the treatment on the computer by cutting all the teeth, cutting all the bones in a simulator, and we can simulate the treatment. I mean, the potential outcome in, in 3D for any type of patient. So that's that I think will open up a lot of possibilities for uh, the OI population in the near future. Um, I, I know it must be, and I know it's frustrating for people who are just trying to find a, a dentist that knows anything about OI, and then we have all this wonderful research going on. I, how, how do you think the best way to disseminate that or to, to you know, 
motivate other dentists in the in the country to to want to learn more? Uh, yeah, that's 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 just very interesting, and I still believe that you know it's like everything else. When you do it once, you have to practice and do it often to be good at what you do. The biggest issue with rare disease, and that's why we have craniofacial centers like the Mercy in Kansas City, where there's a lot of cleft palate. Why? Because we take all the cleft palate from one the same region, which is basically Missouri, Kansas, Arkansas, and a little bit of, uh, of uh, Nebraska, the south, and then uh, the north goes to, go, goes to Omaha. We have a center. Uh, a dentist that lives in Lexa, one today in Oswego, sees maybe one OI patient in, in his, his life or her lifetime. It's very difficult to be good at this and feel comfortable. So the problem that it depends on the severity also, obviously the OI uh, type one could see a, a general dentist, but the more severe types of OI, I think could be probably better addressed in a, um, I would say, um, a sense type center environment. So I don't know if, if I make myself clear, but I'm trying to tell you that the uh, the dentist from, I know, you know uh, the, the regional dentist may have a problem treating OI severe patients because it's kind of complicated for everyone. So I think the best would be eventually to, to try to get dentists who are ready to accept patients who have specific issues and get good at it. So it's a matter of practicing and again, getting comfortable. It's hard to do. Yeah. Yeah. So there's an exciting new study coming up that is, is using aligners. Can you talk a little bit about that? And aligners like Invisalign or, you know, Smile Direct, whatever, all the aligners. But can you explain why? And this was your idea. So this is very exciting. Why we're using aligners in a study? Well, it came up. Yeah. Sorry, Sorry. It, I, I'm getting a, a little bit of echo here. Okay, that's fine. Uh, basically, what happened is, first of all, we, we did the longitudinal study, the 7701, with the 01 was the first one. We, we looked at many, many patients. We looked at, hey, you know, and a lot of my patients would tell me, well, it's very nice to do the study, but uh, what can you do more for me? And I said, well, you know, we could have uh, probably tried to do some orthodontic treatment. But as you know, many uh, OI subjects also have dentinogenesis imperfecta, which means that putting braces on those teeth is a little bit risky and complicated. So I, I said, you know what? I tried a few cases with um, uh, patients that had OI type four or OI type, not type four. And I, I did a lot of braces on type ones, but it's, it's irrelevant. And, and actually it worked pretty well. So I said, I told Dr. Rush, I think we should, we have something here. So why don't we, and Dr. Rush is a great researcher. He said, well, if you have, you think you have something we should do a study and really make sure that what you think you have is actually reproducible worldwide. So that's why we ended up with an NIH grant that looks at treating OI subjects of moderate severity with uh, aligners because aligners do apply good forces on teeth. And I think they should give us a good outcome. The problem is we have to do the research before we know exactly how they work. So that's our new project and it should start in the fall of 2021 uh, with like 40 patients, I think. And um, see, and we have three centers, see if we can get good results, what's gonna happen. So we wanna look at how the bone reacts to a force, which is the OI bone and applies the forces through the teeth and how well the teeth will respond and how well they will move. So there is always, you know, uh, it's a bit of an uncertainty, but at the moment I had some good, good success on a pilot type study, but now we want to make it a whole lot more organized with the NIH and in, uh, in, uh, Dr. Lee in, uh, in uh, Washington. And I think we should get some good, re hopefully good results. And then we can push it to uh, publications again, and other orthodontists can use the, the technology to, the, to their advantage. Now, you mentioned outcomes a couple of times with the aligners. What is, what's the outcome? What do we want to see? It's not just cosmetic, right? It's not just to have straight teeth. Well, yeah. well, that's a great question because I hope you didn't ask it, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> because OI, oh, you know, people say I've got crooked teeth. That's cool. Problem with OI subjects, if their crooked teeth are very different from the crooked teeth from the non-affected subject. Maybe non-affected people have like a big overbite, 
or crooked teeth, but the OI uh, uh, subject, many times their back teeth don't touch at all. They only have a bit of contact in the front because of the growth pattern. And what happens is they don't really know because they can only chew on a few selected teeth. And, and it also affects their mastication power. And obviously the, the aesthetics is affected too. We all know that, but my, my problem I was having with the, um, this problem is the open, it's called an open bite. It's in the back and nothing's touching. And one of my patients, Nolan, was so cool because he woke up his mother in the middle of the night because we are, we are finishing his case. And all of a sudden, he noticed that his back teeth were touching and he could chew, but he never chewed before. So he didn't know. He was not aware of it. So every time I was asking, how's it going? He said, well, it's going okay. Why are you asking me that? Well, and one day he said, wait a minute, this is touching. It's so cool. And so I was very happy about that. So again, uh, the orthodontics alone may not be able to achieve the perfect set up the perfect mastication power but i think we can improve it dramatically and that's the, and obviously the aesthetics will follow too or be be a part of the of the correction but my main uh interest is in mastication and function so someone who has di can they participate in this study yes uh again it's going to be my call or the call and we have a we have a committee uh we'll have Take, we'll have pictures, we'll have radiographs, we'll have everything. And it's going to be a, a call on if we feel the teeth are too affected, we won't do it. So it's a, it's a, it's a um, severity-based selection process. So it's patients between the age of 12 and 14. I can I have to reread the exact age, but I think it's 12 to 40. Uh, we don't discriminate for age, but it's just the, the age that will work the best. So that's why we want to have the for a small sample that we have, we need the patients who will respond the best. So from the age of 12 to 40, we'll have people who have moderate OI and DI. So if it's, uh, it could be a OI type one without DI at all, which is dentinogenesis imperfecta, it could be a type four, even all the way to a type three, depending on the severity. But if the teeth are too affected, uh, and there is a, a uh, the, the probability of a fracture are too great, then we will not accept the patient again no one has ever done this before so it's kind of a we have to be extra cautious at right. the beginning right um and just one last question about the study people with caps or you know or, or restruct you know re whatever restorative work or whatever can can they participate yeah i think i think the um the participant rate is again uh moderate di moderate malocclusion and anything that we can look into and say well we have a good chance to improve so we are it's a, there is what we use we use a a uh, no, scale uh, an index sorry we use an index and the index has to be you have to be within the certain number of index and what we want to do is obviously reduce the severity we we won't get to zero and we are going to be trying to to get the subjects to improve as much as we can. But again, it's not for everyone. You have to fit in the index first because it's a not a pilot study, but it's a prospective study. And we, we have to put parameters of, of selection called selection criteria. And the selection criteria is a very is very strict because again, we want to be uh, looking at tooth movement in moderate OI subjects. And remind us again what malocclusion means, just so we're all in the same. Yeah, crooked teeth. Malocclusion is crooked teeth. In the case of uh, OI subjects, is crooked teeth or non-interrupted teeth or teeth that are already out of out of position. And it's mainly also, as you know, the jaws are not always correctly aligned. Uh, these, the patients that we will select, the subject will select. We will select subject will have fairly well aligned jaws because then we we go into surgery and this is not the aim of the study so the pretty well aligned jaws very crooked teeth open bite but nothing super severe great thank you i have one last question for you before we get to questions from from the community sure. um it, and this is sort of a you know sort of an open question but if you could do any kind of, of research, if you had all the money in the world um, for, for our community to study craniofacial dental issues, what, what would you want to do next? 
I would, first of all, buy myself a trip to Vietnam. Okay. So I love to go there, but the real reason is the money is not for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I, the real reason is by coincidence. I was there three or four years ago, and there is a population of OI subject that is I've never been treated with bisphosphonate or anything. So I have this little idea in my head that maybe, and I don't know, maybe Dr. Gro would be unhappy with me. So maybe I should say that. But anyway, I'll say it anyways. <laughs> I think that the maxilla, which is the upper jaw is somewhat affected by the bifosphonate. But it doesn't mean that we should be, there is a lot of good point with the bifosphonate. Everybody knows about that. The problem is the upper jaw and even the lower forms, partly because the teeth are erupting. And as we say, they bring bone. The teeth erupt and they bring bone with them. That's why you get bigger jaws, OK? Or partly because you get bigger jaws. Hmm. And I like to see a sample of patients that have never been treated with bifosphonate and, and study their jaw development. That's the, my first goal. I got one, I think there is one group in Brazil and there is one group in Vietnam. So if I could do that, and I was supposed to go and COVID hit and that's unfortunate. So, um, because I teach in Vietnam, so that'd be very expensive to just go and see them. That's the first thing. And the second thing is uh, something that has been bugging me also is a lot of these uh, subject or, or I subject have sleep apnea and some other issues. And I'd like to be able to, to uh, do the, the research to see if, again, bringing the maxilla forward when they're very young, like six, seven, eight years of age, would help them or not. That'd be a great study. The problem is, again, is to get a grant for that, is to have the team for that. So right now we're doing the other aligner study. So that would be more of a cranial facial study the one i'm doing now is more of a dental study i'm just moving teeth around with aligners to see if we can improve the function the other one would be purely purely um cranial facial and that'd be nice especially on semi severe subject to take the jaw and just slowly bring it down and forward so you can imagine that you get a better projection of your upper jaw so everything is nicer and probably you'll get a better outcome because I got this idea from listening to another group who actually does cervical surgeries from KKI, but they go from the back and I was listening, wait a minute, I could do this from the front too. So that would be an interesting concept. So that, if I had the money in the world, what I would, at the moment, that was I would do, you know? Yep, yep. Thank you, Dr. Retrovay, so, so much. Um, okay. Thank you for leading the Brittle Bone Disorders Consortium. Well, it's my, it's my privilege to be associated with you, ladies and gentlemen. It's been a great trip, trust me. I love it. <laughs> so, Michael, yeah. I'm going to turn it over to you for some very specific questions, I guess. Yeah, um, thank you both so much. So, we received a bunch of questions during the registration for today's event, and I already see some questions rolling into the chat. I'm going to jump into some of the questions from registration first, but to those writing in questions, thank you. We will we'll try to get to a bunch. Um, so I actually want to back up a little bit because I know we sort of jumped straight into uh, your research, but we had a few questions kind of just simply getting at the question of um, like how does OI impact dental health? And I guess as a side note is like, is there anything that you think sort of surprises people about how OI impacts dental health? Well, it does two things. First of all, it's brittle bone. So the jaw, the upper and lower jaws are affected. And I thought until three or four years ago that you could never break, and I've never seen one, you could break a lower jaw. And lo and behold, in the past two years, I had five mandibular fractures, which is fractures of the lower jaw. And one of my cutie little patients called me one day and the mom calls me and says, I got a hard time eating, really. Yeah, I bit on the on, on the peanut and on the peanut, sorry, and my jaw cracked. I said, come on, that can't be no. So we sent her for x-rays, and yes, she had broken the jaw because at her age the big molars were coming in, and there was very little bone around the molars. So because she has OI type three, she had even less bone. So she just bit on, on and something wrong way, whatever, the jaw cracked. So we are able to, to, to manage that really nicely. I got another one that had jaw fracture following uh, wisdom teeth removal. So I got a few. So the mandible, yes, can definitely fracture. So I have to be careful with that. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the, at the bone level. I only have one case out of a thousand and more that we suspect strongly had ONJ and I'll answer to, to that one later on. But it has 
a very significant effect on the maxillary, which is the upper jaw projection. So the maxilla stays too high and too far back. So then the lower jaw rotates and then the teeth don't match. So you can't really chew well. So that's a problem. And there are different degrees of severity on that one. And obviously you have dental genesis imperfecta, which affects the dentin, which is the inside of the tooth, like an egg, you know, the enamel would be the outside and the dentin would be the inside. So the dentin becomes very brittle and very uh, non-solid. So the teeth tend to fracture. By the way, uh, Tracy, that's something I like to see because I, I suspect that people who have bifosphonates have actually better dentin, even if it's discolored. I've, I've noticed less fractures on these people, but I, don't, I can't prove it. But I, that's something that would make sense. But anyways, that's a different story. And then they also have impacted teeth and the shape that are not, uh, teeth are not really well shaped. So there is a whole, a whole spectrum of problems, not just one. And depending on some, uh, some, some um, uh, subject, I got one fantastic. She's uh, from Quebec. She has a Y6. She had 147 fractures. She has the best dentition I've ever seen. Interesting. Perfect. She has no DI, she has nothing. She's OI6 and she's in a wheelchair and she breaks all the time, but the teeth are perfect. So, okay. So that's, that's an outlier, we call them. And she's a funny lady. She does all sorts of things, but, and we became friends, but that's a different story. And other ones don't break much, but have very severe DI and they break their teeth all the time. So it's, it's totally an individualized setup. You have to look at the patient, not as a group, but as one at a time. Fascinating. Thank you so much. Um, no so it's interesting too, because you bring up that there's like such a broad spectrum of ways that it can impact. And actually, so we received a bunch of uh, registration questions that are basically people asking uh, more specific questions about certain yeah. procedures. Um, I know you and I have talked, at, if someone who has attended any of the OIF National Conference dental sessions, we've asked many of the similar questions again uh, questions talking about, you know, can you comment on bridges? Can you comment on uh, uh, different types of teeth uh, removal? Things talking about how to treat cracked teeth. Um, I have a feeling if we had a three-hour session, we would not have enough time to address all these things. I was wondering, uh, one thing I'm seeing here, and also particularly in the chat just now, is people are asking about I'm going to pronounce this wrong. I apologize. Uh, osteochronosis of the jaw. Yeah, ONG. Um, and they're asking about, are there any risks there or things to consider with someone with that and going through bisphosphonate therapy, particularly pimidronate or any of the others as well? Yeah, the, it's, a, it's a great question. You know, normally and theoretically with the dosage, we should have a lot more. Oh, okay, wait a minute. I'm going to quiet down. Uh, uh, for, for those with us, uh, Dr. Retrieve is at a friend's house with a, a large barking dog. So we apologize. Yeah. Well, I, th I think you've got the control. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, so <laughs> maybe not. <laughs> it happens. I apologize for the technical difficulty to everyone that's, you know, take real dog outside. Remote. I think the question to Michael yeah. so about... What I'm saying is, sorry, I'm going to answer that. Sorry. So what I'm saying is you have to understand that, first of all, all the teeth for OI patients are not great. So invest in the good ones. I've noticed a lot of people spend a ton of money on teeth that are very low prognosis, as we call them, and it becomes a massive expense. So if you have two very bad, bad teeth, please invest in the other ones. If you have a severe OI. But the second thing is... Ask dentists who know a little bit more. Again, the dentine is affected. It's not so much the enamel. The enamel, the enamel will break because it doesn't have support from the under, from the uh, from the dentine on the. So it will break and become that's why called brittle enamel too. But the, if the dentine is no good, you have to have a, you have to get a full crown around the tooth to make it more solid. You know, and again, it has to be a tooth which has a fairly good prognosis. I noticed that many times. People spend a lot of money for teeth that are not really salvageable and then they complain that the others have not been really uh, well addressed so dentino genesis imperfecta is very frustrating because it's the inside of the tooth that is not very good it's not the outside so i don't know if that answers your question 
The second question is, I got one came to see me and she's, why don't I get dentures? So dentures is also an, an, a good option, unfortunately for a small period of time, because then you have no more pain, the teeth are gone. Uh, you can get dentures, but they are loose. Uh, and then what happens is the bone will resorb fairly quickly. And then the dentist get the dentures, sorry, get very loose, very fast. And that's, that's also frustrating at one point. So there is no valid option. I would say I try to maintain the dentition in its best possible shape for as long as you can. That's all I can say at the moment because it's a very complicated uh, therapy. Uh, but unfortunately, I have no, no more answers to give you. But full crown seems to be the one that works the best. Got it. Can you actually speak a, a, a bit more about that? It's a very interesting philosophy you brought up about investing in the teeth that have uh, like a better outlook. Um, yes. I guess I'm curious, like, you know, because I, like many other people, have gone to the dentist and sometimes you just sort of like, you know, you, we are not seeing uh, doctors or dentists like you with decades of OI experience. And we kind of just like follow what they tell us to do. Um, and then we, I'm, I'm curious, like, what does that look like in practice, investing in the teeth that like have a better prognosis? Like, what does that mean in more practical terms? Well, I can give you an example that is totally unrelated to why. I just gave a lecture on Saturday to a, a group of pediatric dentists on, it's called hypomineralization of molars, which is a very strange phenomenon where the upper molars get really bad. And a lot of these kids have a very poor quality of life because that they get multiple fillings, multiple root canals, multiple everything. And at the end of the day, they're going to lose the tooth at 20, 30 or 35 years old. We made a study, not me, the Northern European dentist made a study and they said, why don't you just remove the teeth? And that's it when the patient is very young. And they found that actually uh, the other teeth drifted in position and it was a better outcome overall. So I would argue for, if you go back to OI uh, patients or subjects, that you go to a dentist and you say, listen, can you tell me on each tooth, which one has a better prognosis and how much money I invest on this tooth and how much money I got to invest on this one to save it? It doesn't mean that you should remove all the teeth. That's not what I'm saying. But if one molar is really broken down and has significant problems, and you may elect to keep it and spend as much money as you can to, to and, and also you have to calculate the value of this tooth in function. Is it worth saving? Because maybe it's not even touching and the bite is not even there and there is no contact. This tooth is basically just useless. So maybe, again, if it's not decayed or as a small filling, just do it. But I'm saying if you have to invest a significant amount of money, well, and if you are limited in what you can spend, you may elect to spend the money on the rest of the teeth, which are probably have a better outcome. So it's a matter, it's called outcome assessment. Okay. So, and a lot of dentists do it reverse. They, they kind of see the tooth and say, I got a root canal, I'm going to put a crown, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. And then they kind of forget about the rest and the patient has no more money and he has a one tooth saved and he said, what am I going to do with the rest? Mm -hmm. So it's a matter of getting a full assessment from the dentist and appreciate that everybody is, has different financial means and everybody has different DI and OI. So again, you have to find someone who is experienced with the craniofacial conditions. And that's why I'm, I'm happy to be with the, the, the Mercy because we see all sorts of patients who have the same, not just OI, people have the same problem, you know? And sometimes we just take a few teeth out because it's actually, the outcome is much better. Doesn't mean that you should do it on every patient. I don't say that, but please study the case as a full dent, dentition, not just one tooth at a time, which we tend to do as dentists. Concentrate on the full image, okay? Great. Thank hey, you so much. Michael, real quick, Dr. Retrovay, can you can you comment on ONJ? Because I know that was a question yes. that, that well, came ONJ, up. Yeah, yeah. ONJ, we did a study at the children's again. We extracted teeth on 140, and it's not me, it's Dr. Duidat and Dr. Uh, Schwartz, I think, did the study. They extracted teeth on 150 kids, not so much on adults. They never had a problem. And I got a call one day from uh, BC, right, Suzanne? It was from Vancouver. Patient flew in <laughs> again. You're going to be bad lucky. So anyways, she was at McGill. So Dr. Dr. Frank said to me, okay, I'm going to send you the patient. Fine. 
it was icy. She fell. She broke her arm coming in. That was not good. But anyways, that's and she was tough as nails. But when I looked in the mouth, she had lost a lot of teeth and she was 18 years old. And the geneticist and the uh, doctor in Vancouver was asking me. So I looked and I think that was a case of ONJ. But she didn't get any dental treatment. She didn't get anything. She just got, she just lost a ton of teeth and it looked pretty much like ONJ. And then for whatever reason, everything healed up and I never saw her again. She went back to Vancouver and I tried to stay in contact. And I said, if you have any problems, girl, call me. And I never heard of her. So I got a ton of pictures, but that's my only case of suspected ONJ that I ever seen in my life. So sorry for OI fairly young subjects. So ONJ usually affects people with reduced immunity, such as cancer patients, mm -hmm. older patients, and these, yes. So I don't know if it's common in OI older patients or subjects, I don't know, but I've never seen, except for this one, I've never seen one myself. And, and ONJ, just to remind us, is, a, is a, an eruption or what, what, what does it look like? ONJ is for osteonecrosis of the jaw, okay? So what happens for whatever reason, it's like if, I mean, I'm going to make a, a parallel that doesn't make a whole lot of sense, if you burn yourself really bad. The, the, there is no healing in the middle, it's necrosis. So the tissue will not heal, it will become white and it will die. So you have some a crater of old and broken down tissue and slowly you have to take a lot of antibiotics, you have to get debridement of this tissue until the whole area will close again. So you have the risk of even losing your jaw. I had a few cases in my practice of that. And it's very close to what we call also osteomyelitis, which is the same concept, which is again, an infection of the bone. So be careful. It has to be taken very seriously. It's not just some pimple. Sometimes you see a small pimple, but the pimple is actually a sign of a much deeper problem. So be very careful with that. Interesting, thank you. Um, we actually had some questions about the, so I keep mixing up uh, the the uh, uh, the plastic aligners versus I accidentally will say Invisalign all the time. Uh, but people were asking about the, um, how could they enroll if they're, if you are still open to uh, new spots or volunteers for your yes. uh, aligner study. Yes. And also you had mentioned before, there are three locations where you're doing it. Yes. I'd be curious, what are those three locations? There's one in the NIH, Washington. One is UCLA and one is Kansas City, uh, is Mind Center. Um, at the beginning, Kansas City was gonna be only and UCLA and the other one was smaller, but we decided, you know what? We'll take whoever we can. Because Invisalign has this big advantage is I can actually look at the case from anywhere in the world. It's all on the computer. So we, we're going to work, the three of us. So whoever is going to do the scans is actually, at the end of the day, not of massive importance. So we will do, we have a team of myself and Dr. Sang and Dr. Can't remember the name, I do apologize, from Washington that we will study the case together. So the cases will be studied on the computer. Uh, you have to go a, a scan of your teeth, you can get photographs, you have to get x-rays, but the intraoral scan it becomes a 3D image of your dentition and it can be shared through the Invisalign platform. So that's the concept. And then we move your teeth in the platform of Invisalign and then we fabricate the plastic trays, which are sequential trays that move the teeth in the sequence. Mm -hmm. So that's the way it's gotta be. And obviously we have all the research uh, mandates that we have to do, calculate the movement, all sorts of things. Um, so it's, it, it's, uh, it's actually, I think that we don't charge for the, uh, the treatment, but it's a time commitment. It's a bit more tedious than just going to a dentist for that. But you have, you have a, you're part of the research project. So that's, that's the idea. But remember, anybody that has an interest could send me an email or send you an email, maybe Michael, I don't know. Uh, and, and we'll have to kind of do a screening because I understand that people don't want to drive 12 hours one way to just be told, you know what, you're not a candidate. So we have to do some screenings. Um, we're still working on that. Um, and I'll be more than happy to see patients. That's, that's for sure. 
Great. Uh, thank you so much. I do know in the flyer we shared out there was some contact information. So the email that everyone used to log into this session, I know there's more information there. Um, I, so it, it sounds like actually you don't need to live in those three cities to, or hypothetically, you do not need to live in those three cities to participate. Yes and no. You, it's better if you live not too, too far or if you have a means, because again, we are going to be seeing the patients every two months. Mm -hmm. So you want to drive a thousand miles, six weeks, Suzanne says six weeks, six or seven weeks, whatever. I don't remember. Um, you don't, you know, it's still a fairly, I know that you can drive. It's okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> After three or four times, it becomes yeah. a bit long, you know? So I got people from Houston call me and other people from Texas. I have no issues, but I told them it's not one shot. I mean, it's not coming and it's, it has to be a, a commitment. Uh, and so I'd rather you know in advance that's why yeah. los angeles washington and kansas city is okay because we have a fairly large population in nebraska ourselves and everything but it's a it's a it's a significant commitment of time and you have to wear the trays and you have to just 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 uh you know and i don't a lot of people are doing it don't get me wrong but you just you have to be aware of what the uh, implications of enrolling are great thank you and i see you one of my colleagues just posted into, into the chat a link about with more details about uh, your study. So Excellent. if people have uh, more questions, want to check it out after this call, feel free to go there. Um, I see we have one. Actually, but before we forget, I see that we have we've had multiple questions about uh, people are asking about the use of mi uh, mini implants, uh, particularly for people with smaller jaws. And I'm yes. definitely curious to ha know if you have used these or do have you used them in the past? Do you recommend them for use for people with small mouths? That's a great question. Um, mini implants were popular for a while and kind of fell a little bit out of favor. Um, the, the mini implant is not just the size, it's a different type of an implant. An implant, a regular implant has two, two, uh, two parts. One goes into the bone, like a fake root. And then there is another one called the abutment, that's a fake crown or the fake attachment we put on. The mini implant is one screw. It does everything at the same time. So it has been used in the past. And I think I haven't seen too much of it lately, but maybe they're... The, the, um, prognosis or outcome didn't go as well as planned, I can't say. But uh, what happens is you just have a smaller screw, like a regular implant goes from about four millimeters wide, which is uh, a tenth of an inch, a bit stronger, bigger than that. The mini implant is 1.5. So it's a lot smaller. And usually we make them longer, which for an OI patients may not be the best thing we can do. Uh, OI subjects usually have a problem for implants is the height of the bone is very small. So the quality of the bone is a problem, but the height is also a problem. Implants work well. They have to be at least eight to 10 millimeters long. Otherwise, they just don't work. It's too small. Okay. So you have a problem with implants and OI. One is the quality of bone. The implant will actually integrate meaning it's going to fuse to the bone. So the bone has to be actively reacting with the titanium and building a bond, like you almost weld the implant to the bone. The bone will grow on the titanium. So it, there's a lot of studies that prove that OI subjects who don't have severe OI seem to be able to fuse the bone to the implant. The problem is there are complications because many times the bone with time will tend to um, to, to fall off the implant, let's put it this way, and then slowly the implant will fail a bit, I would say a bit faster than in average for the, uh, the, the non-affected population. So it's still a, it's still a, a controversial um, topic because it all depends on the quality of bone of a particular individual. I would argue on an OI type one, I wouldn't have a problem. It may heal a bit slower, uh, but you will get integration on an OI type 3 severe with a lot of bifosphonates and everything. I, I don't know if I want to go there, but you want to try it. I, I spoke to one, um, one uh, OI type 3 lady, super nice. She had five implants and she lost two 
the other three states. So why she lost two in the other three states, I have no idea. You know, it may have been because the room at this area was not as good as it could have been. So implants, if you do implants, but please stay with me on that one, go see people who do a lot and go see people who know implants very well. Don't go see someone who does once in a while. Go see people who really know what they're doing because implants are much more complicated to, to position than we think. Great, thank you. Um, on that vein of talking about some more specific treatments, um, what are your thoughts about using caps as a treatment for cracked teeth in people with more severe OI? Yeah, if the tooth is cracked, you put it, putting a tooth on it is not gonna help. So cracked tooth syndrome is different. It depends where the crack is. So if you have a molar with two roots and the crack is in the middle, the, forget the tooth, it's gone, okay? If you have broken a part of your crown and the dentist is gonna rebuild the tooth with a crown, but the roots are, are good, that's a good idea. You understand the difference? And I would also argue, and I've been arguing for this for a long time, and I talked to, uh, remember the name of, uh, what's his name, Ke Kevin? Kevin? Uh, Dr. Ricker. Ricker, that's it, that's yeah. it. And we talked about that. I think that if my humble opinion is metal crowns, which are even the gold crowns are better for OI, especially in the back, don't in the front, no. But in the back, why? Because gold is much more malleable and it fits so much better than porcelain. So we discussed that and he said I was right. And if I had to, if I had to get a gold a crown in my back teeth and have OI, I would probably look at having a gold crown if it, it's not anesthetic because that's a problem because it fits so much better and it protects the tooth a whole lot better than porcelain. So that's that's a little trick I can give you. Some dentists may disagree, but uh, me and Kevin, we we thought about that. And especially because OI teeth tend to be smaller than the average tooth. So the preparation, you have to remove a certain amount of tooth to make the crown. And the least amount you remove, the better. And with uh, OI, uh, with the gold, you remove less. So that's something you can think about. Doesn't mean you should have every single tooth crowned with gold and say that. But if you have small teeth that are a little bit, you know, oddly shaped, it may be a better option than just having a big porcelain crown that may break on you in three years. But I could give you a whole lecture on that, but that's, forget, that's technical stuff, you know. That's to do with the physics, uh, that has to do with the physics of, uh, of the way we prepare teeth. Mm -hmm. um, so could you speak a little bit about uh, what are people's options for jaw correction surgery? Um, I know that Dr. Dr. Napoli would hear, uh, here, he would yeah. also could talk for hours and hours on this, but we'd love to get your thoughts. I can, on give, you, I can give a very, very interesting guidelines. A lot of OI subjects think that their lower jaw is too far forward, but it's not. The majority of the time, it's the upper jaw that is too far back and too high. So the, the needed surgery is actually to take the upper jaw and bring it forward and drop it, which is a complicated surgery. And then automatically the lower jaw will rotate and the profile will improve. So we are rarely, I've done two, I think, surgeries of the lower jaw where we took the lower jaw physically and we cut it and, and set it back. It's called a setback. That is very predictable, by the way. Uh, the problem is it's not really what many of OI subjects need. They need maxillary surgery. And if you see the difference to the maxilla and the mandible, the maxilla has a problem. It has the nose, it has the sinuses, it has teeth. And in OI, there is not a whole lot of bone. And I could show you a ton of pictures on that. And the problem for the surgeons is to find the bone because when you make the surgery, you have to detach the jaw and move it someplace else, right? And the problem is, you what we say in good English, you run out of bone. There's just not enough bone. And the healing power of a OI severe type 3 bone-wise is not the best. So you are actually um, increasing the probability of a poor outcome. So that's why we, we do, Dr. Napoli, we spoke to each other in Florida, I remember three, four years ago, because he's a good buddy of mine. And he showed me a few cases, but they were OI type 1.5, I call them. They were not really OI3 severe. So, and, and it's unfortunate because the OI3s are the ones that would be the most, get the most benefit out of the surgery. 
So I've seen a few papers on that, but I don't have any more to say that to be very prudent and many surgeons will not do OI type three surgery. There's a gentleman in New York too, but I only saw him once that he claims he does a lot of OI type three surgeries of the maxilla. But I, I'm, I'm not an expert and I would not want to get into this sleep, sleep result, but I would be, if I was uh, my kid, I would be a little bit, uh, I would say nervous. But I may be wrong. I don't know. I've been known to be wrong many times. But uh, when you look at the, uh, the, the anatomy of, the, of an upper jaw on an OI type 3 uh, subject, severe, uh, it's, the bone is not, just not there, unfortunately. I don't know if I answered your question or not. Great. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, I see we have one question from a medical professional in the chat, from a Dr. Shivam um, Mita. It's a little bit of a longer question, so I'm, I'm going to uh, read it out. I have a scientific question regarding OI in my past uh, research funded by AAOF and um, NESO. I found that orthodontic tooth movement was significantly slower in OI under the influence of bisphosphonate, considering that many of these patients require significant amounts of tooth movement. What is your vision for the treatment of these patients? as the treatment duration could increase considerably to correct such uh, dental discrepancies. Yeah, the, the, the study is right. Um, that's why we selected patients or subjects with very specific um, degrees of severity. Um, teeth move very slowly and you have to be very patient. And usually OI subjects are very patient. So that's, that's the idea. So we tell them in advance, you know, uh, this is not gonna go well. Uh, no, well, in a sense, to go fast. You have to be patient with the treatment. You have to wear some elastics for a long period of time, but they are very, they are very uh, light. We put very light forces and you let the bone remodel very slowly. And uh, absolutely, I, I, I do not disagree at all. I mean, we, we, we know that, that teeth, and that's what Dr. Lee and myself are so interested. We really want to see, uh, because we did a study on mice with OI, where it's, a, it's an OI mouse model, mind you, it's not the perfect OI, but we looked at it and there were remodeling. The mo remodeling was present. Remodeling means the bone is reforming at a different place. Uh, there was remodeling, the problem was uh, it was slower, but it still moved. And that's, that's, that's the plan. I mean, when we talk to our patients, we tell them it's gonna take a long time They say, okay. And we don't get the perfect result. And they say, that's all we can do. And okay, that's, that's fine. I mean, obviously, uh, you have missing teeth, you have very poorly angulated teeth. So we try to get to a level that we, and I could talk about that to go to another level, which is called an overdenture, where we can build something over these teeth to make it even better. But that's that's a discussion for another day. Dr. Roger, Ray, can I ask real quick? I mean, I know we're running out of time, but dealing with pain, dental pain, it, yeah. is that how, what's your philosophy advice or, or whatever? Um, my mouth is hurting just hearing talk about everything, and I'm just sure. wondering why you. Dental pain is is one of the worst because you get this massive nerve called the uh, you know the 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 five, and it's uh, it's very very quick. Why we get so bad dental pain instead of I don't know if you pinch your your arm, it's not so bad, and you just bite on something and it hurts for like 15 minutes. Uh, we think it's it's due to the fact that teeth were so important that they are very well innervated. I have no idea to be frank with you, but. You're right, dental pain is high. Um, you have to reduce it as much as possible. And that's why you have to do treatments that minimize the amount of pain and discomfort to get the maximum outcome or the maximum positive outcome. And that's why I, I listen to a lot of people say, I've suffered, I've done this, I've done that, I spent my life there. And look, look at the, 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 the result is really bad. So that's why I'm a little bit worried sometimes to send our OI population to people who don't treat them often. And I've noticed also, mind you, it's different because as you know, OI subjects live in pain pretty much all their lives. They have a very different pain response than the average. I'm not sure that the average person could tolerate the pain they go through. We all know that. And I'm not an expert in OI pain, but I can just talking to them, I can see that they, they are in pain pretty much all the time. So they learn to deal with this in a very, their own ways, I would call that. And usually the treatments have done, they, they tend to be tough. For whatever reason, they tend to be tougher than the average patient. And I don't know why. That's the way it is, okay? But at the same time, 
you have to try to reduce it as much as possible. So that's why when I did my Invisalign treatments, we, we almost doubled the number of trays, which means that we move the teeth very, very, very slowly. And I told the patients, you want to do this? We're going to do it with this way, because if we go the average route, it will probably fail. And we got some okay results. Uh, right now I'm treating patients. She doesn't have the eye and she has OI3. And we are treating her with, uh, with actually brackets, which is bizarre. And she doesn't complain. She says it's fine. So I, I don't know if, it's, if the response to pain is different or it's because it's such a learned behavior for an OI subject. I don't know. I'm, I, I'm not in the boat, so I can't say. You know, it's pain is such a personal experience that is complicated for me, but all we try to do is minimize discomfort as much as possible and not get into impossible treatment options that don't make sense. Thank you. Okay. Um, so speaking of like also like prevention too, um, so like what are some good habits slash procedures for actively strengthening and protecting both like the dentinal walls and also uh, a few people have been talking about having hollow roots in their teeth well that's it's actually interesting it's not really hollow roots the roots tend to calcify which is the reverse uh, they have very wide roots when they're young and they calcify very very fast and that they, that's why they get even more brittle because they lost they lose nutrition so that's a problem um the experience supposedly, and I don't know if it's true, when dentinogenesis imperfecta usually will give you more inflammation in the teeth, which requires probably a higher rate of failure for the anesthesia. So I've got a question in the chat, and I think, yes, we did a few, and I'm not an expert in that, but I've seen it. You usually need more anesthesia for kids with the eye than kids without. The teeth are just more sensitive. And I don't know why, that's, that's not my area of expertise. Uh, the dentin is different, maybe the nerves are different, the nerve conduction is different, I don't know. But it seems to be a, a higher threshold or actually a lower threshold of pain uh, for the same level of anesthesia. You go to the dentist, already you have to be frozen solid, so it's not as uncomfortable, you know, if you're not, you don't like it. Mm -hmm. um, so these kids are in a, in a more complicated. And again, if they require extractions, you gotta be super careful because not to break the bone. So it becomes, it becomes a double, a double um, problem. That's why I tend to tell people who have severe OI and slash DI, go try to go to centers where at least, like Dr. Napoli in Philadelphia, but I know not, not everybody can go there, but he, he does a ton of patients and he's really good at this. So have him refer you to people who are at least who treat rare disease patients, not necessarily OI, but people who are used to all the anesthesia, all the pr protocols, that just the average dentist across the street who wants to do good and runs into trouble. You know, I don't want to discourage dentists to treat OI patients, not at all. I'm saying is if you've never treated an OI type three, it may be a, a better idea to find someone who is more comfortable. And I think Kevin, Dr. Kevin, uh, is always saying the same thing. I think you have to be comfortable with these patients. And I think he has it because he has a Y1, so he understands a whole lot more of the, of the problem than I do. Great. Thank you so much. And actually, on that note, um, I want to let everyone know that. So the uh, OI Foundation also has up on our YouTube page a recording of the dental session from the National Conference with Dr. Ricker, mm -hmm. with also Dr. Napoli and Dr. Retrove, of course, talking. They get into a bit more detail about some of these different uh, 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 cases and common talking points about dental health and OI. I definitely recommend everyone check that out if they are still have uh, want to learn more. Uh, Dr. Retrove, thank you so much for joining us here this evening. We really yeah. appreciate it. Uh, yeah, and, and, so sorry, Michael, I'm going to interrupt for a second. If anybody has a question, I don't have a problem. Just give me that. They, they, they can send me an email, personal email. I have no, no issues. I don't say I'm going to, right now, I'm, I'm going to a conference tomorrow in Milwaukee, but um, I, I will respond within a week, or at least try to find the response, the, the answer that to their question. And I, I do because I think I think by having more people aware of the conditions and aware of how we can approach uh, these these sub these patients and the nice people, the really nice people, they really have 
a tough time with our mouth. We need to do better. And I hope we will. At the moment, uh, we still have a lot to learn. That's unfortunate. Great. Um, thank you so, so much. This was so yes, fun thank you. quite a while. Yeah, you take care. Great. I'm going to go thank hide you. the dogs now. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. okay. Thanks, everyone, Bye -bye. for joining us. Thank you, everyone, Bye -bye. for joining us. Good night. And hopefully, we'll Good see night. you all soon. Good night.